right. Hello. Welcome to the Monroe podcast. I'm Tom Pruchet, Director of Electrification for Monroe and Associates. Uh, we are here today with ABB. I've got Matthew Young and Cliff Fitzek. Um, my background is in electrification and electronics, and uh, I'm going to interview these gentlemen about their wonderful product line and perhaps a little talk about some alliance we have. So with that, um, please, gentlemen, introduce yourself. Matthew, you can go first. All right. Thanks, Tom. Happy to be here. Uh, really excited to share what ABB is doing in this space with you guys. Um, I am working on our, our segment of the market we call EV grid to charger. And it's everything that helps power chargers and, and safely and sustainably move that electricity from the grid through the site and bring all the features that EV planners want um, down into the charger and into the car and the site. So really excited to uh, be here with you and, and talk about the technology we've been working on. Yeah, it's exciting for me as well being being on with you. Um, as you mentioned, Cliff Fitzek, I'm the head of charger operations at ABB eMobility. So on the charger side and happy to really see together with Matt how the whole ecosystem works together. I started my career a long time ago at BMW, then was running technology at Electrify America. So industry veteran on the EV side. So helping with all of you to move that forward. All right, very good. Well, with that, we should get started. We have lots of things to talk about. Um, our viewers may know that we've had some contact in the past. Um, we went and saw the product of some of your work when we were at, in Chicago a few weeks ago. I uh, had a life-changing experience seeing an electric NASCAR vehicle, and uh, we had a lot of discussion about how an infrastructure could take place for uh, you know, an entity like NASCAR, but it's that and so much more. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the details. <clears throat> so with that, so let's talk a little about a little bit about your grid to charger solutions. Um, there's, you know, a lot of technology involved. Um, what does it take to go from the grid to an EV charger in, in kind of a short summary, if, if you will? Sure. Yeah, we, you know, we obviously you know, think about a lot of parts of the electrification chain um, at ABB, and this is no exception. We think about the electrical utility grid. We think about the electrical gear that you have on site in the grid edge. Of course, we, we make some of the world's best chargers, as Cliff can easily talk about too, and, and, then, the, and then the vehicle. And so when, when you really get down to it, a lot of folks start with the vehicle and they kind of move backwards up that chain. And w we think about all sides of it. And it's no longer chicken and the egg. It's it's how do we make this a linear process and safely move power, um, and and bring the features along that people want. And so, a lot of folks don't know that there is more than just a charger. You can't plug a charger into a wall. It's not an iPhone when you're fast DC charging a vehicle, right? So, you actually have to have very specific infrastructure, you know, designed and put in place um, in order to. To bring that much power through a site, whether it's a CPO, you know, charging highway charging site or a gas station, or even your own house, um, or or even the much much bigger complex sites, right? So there's there's a lot to think about, and and if you go back a step further, you know, there's a piece of the pie that is you know what the utility's doing at the distribution side, of course. Um, so we're thinking through that whole chain. Um, and the technology involved is, is quite interesting and complex. We can dive deeper into it today, I'm sure. Um, I don't know, Cliff, what, what's your take on, uh, on that from the charger side? Yes, no, absolutely. And I think it's the whole, whole ecosystem. And I think this is what we're learning now uh, with how networks are perceiving the charger integration. So one of the pain points uh, which we identified together with the with the colleagues like, like Matthew and others, is how do we integrate a charger which started out as a level two charger with a seven, seven to 11 kilowatts or 22 kilowatts with a high power charger now 400 and more kilowatts. And this has totally different uh, grid constraints. So you'd have to uh, account for the whole um, and um, energy chain going from the grid into the charger and also including load management and load balancing and, and all of that 
So it's now much more a system approach than just a, a charger approach, as um, what Matt mentioned. You don't just plug it in. There needs to be a whole system set up uh, to have a successful site. Yeah, there's you know also the, the sort of <clears throat> ambiguity that some of our subscribers might still have with regard to the different levels of charging with level one and two, not really being an external charger at all. Those chargers are on board the vehicle, but in this case, you can do those, of course, and then DC fast charging, which is a different animal where you truly do have a charger outside the vehicle and it interacts with the vehicle um, in a very significant way. So I know I have an appreciation for what it takes to go to the charger and then even further out to the uh, the vehicle itself. So thank you for that. Right. And, and let, 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 let me add on to this. I think this is also how we see the, the industry evolving. 10 years ago, we were all happy to have at home uh, 10, 10 kilowatts uh, charging, which everyone, the, the grid and everyone was already complaining about, oh, you're going to bring down the grid. Now we're talking about sites with one charge of 400 kilowatts, 10 chargers, uh, all of that, and that needs to be managed. So the aspect and the, the system thinking on that side is a much different aspect now than it has been in the past. Very nice. So on to other questions. We have so many here. Um, how does it ABB ensure seamless integration of grid charger infrastructure in both the urban and rural environments. So you've got a little different situation in these two environments. Um, you know, this easy integration, you want to have a single product or maybe a, a multitude of products that cover both of those um, sort of regional applications um, well. So any thoughts on that that you can bring to the table? Tons of thoughts, uh, Tom. <laughs> we, you know, ABB has been in the game a long time. And, 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 you know, when we first started making chargers, we didn't just make chargers. We, we continue to develop them. And, and now we make some of the world's best chargers, of course. But we also spent a lot of time over the last 15 years learning how to make the best equipment to power those chargers. So a lot of times people will know a switchboard or a power panel um, or some sort of microgrid, you know, interconnection device or whatever. Um, we've spent a long time not just not just learning how to integrate the electrical world into this space as it as Cliff says as it grows out of your garage and into full you know giant power needs at campuses. Right. Um, we spent time figuring out how to optimize that, and that means altitude. That means temperature. That means rural. That means urban. That means you know massive complexity or just a couple right and so at the end of the day you've got products that we've taken and aligned and we have worked with customers all over the world to say what what really works here you know what's the best thing we need for cold weather you know or whatever you know and so to answer your question you know how do we ensure the seamless integration it's really the answer is experience um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to try to power a charger. Um, there are a few ways that will that will really work well for decades, right? And you you want to have a you want to have an installation that will last for a long time, right? You don't want to have to rip everything out of the ground, right? So, the experience of what we've learned with everything from pest screens to space heaters to breakers that you can change out later when you upgrade your chargers. All of those things, so you don't have to rip out all the gear as you go. That becomes a really, really important factor for a lot of our customers. Um, you know, and 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 you want to you want to get that right because then you get to use the magic word called future proof, right? And people love that. <laughs> nobody nobody wants to have to rip everything out, um, you know, if they don't need to. So, um, you know, there. The other thing I will say, and, and I'll let Cliff, you know, give his perspective too, of course. But you know, the breaker that is inside these pieces of equipment that ultimately powers that charger on your site. It's a computer uh, and, and it has tons of capability, right? And that's, that's the magic on bringing so many more features into a site that people are really looking for. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's experience and technology innovation that really makes it seamless over time. And of course, listening to your customers along the way. You know, of course, that experience probably extends into uh, the design of the equipment for scalability so you can handle a, a small installations, say, like what we have here at Monroe & Associates 
or a large scale, you know, public site that might even have to accommodate semi tractor trailers. So, um, you know, any comments about how that works? You know, it's those are different applications, but it seems that you've got a pretty wide um, list of components that could fill either of those applications well, but I'll leave you to kind of describe that. I think it's really uh, moving to platforms. In the past, there was a lot of custom set up for custom um, applications. Uh, every site was different. So working together on the, the switchboard side and on the charger side is, is building platforms, having standardized uh, switchboards, having standardized breakers, going all the way into, into the charger and really more or less an off-the-shelf uh, product because it helps on the operational side uh, with spare parts, with, with updates, with, they're easier to maintain because it's not a special build for everyone. And you see that on both sides. You see that on the uh, downstream grid side as well as in the charger side to uh, have right now on the A400, which you see behind me, you have uh, more or less three domains, a cloud domain, a power domain, and a customer experience domain. The front side is the customer experience domain, which you can swap uh, across platforms. You can do it with the power modules as well, as well with the cloud really coming to that standardized approach, which then also allows for scalability. And, and Tom, let me let me add on one one little thing there. If, if if people didn't catch that, like that A400 charger over over Cliff's shoulder, people need to look at that. It's really cool. But the the fact that you've got a partner who says, I understand the drivers, I understand the automakers, I understand the charger and the charging experience. I understand the gear you're going to need on your site. And I speak utility. Like if only there was a company that had all of that, right? Like <laughs> That's we, a we, lot we, of hats. <laughs> we, right, right. we have a lot of fun because, you know, we play this role and, um, and, and, and it's something that, you know, we're not, we're not new to it. And so we find that like we can sit back and take that systems approach. We can take, we can sit back and look at it. I mean, we're, we're multiple teams at, at a company called ABB, but like we can really look at the industry and say, what's really going on and what's really going to solve the problem. And, and it's amazing the traction and the, and the advancement that we've seen because of that, that way we go to market. Nice. So of course we've been talking about the grid to the charger. Um, there's that and so much more. Um, you know, renewable energy can tend to be a nuisance. Everyone wants to have a battery to do some load leveling um, or minimization of how much power is needed from the utility at peak times. Uh, and then you'll have clients, I'm sure, who want to add sort of wind and solar to your mix. And uh, so maybe some comments on how that works, if you will, and you know, how you do it. Yeah, yeah. This is one of those things where, uh, to your earlier point about um, streamlining and, and optimization. You know, we we like to say that the features that EV chargers, EV charging planners want, start in the breakers. Um, a lot of them will start in that in that computer, right? That that is uh, controlling a lot of stuff. And the, and the reason I say that is, you can connect any source directly to one of our switchboards, whether that's the utility or multiple utility connections. You can connect solar, wind. You can connect battery. You can connect a direct microgrid directly in, right? And, uh, you know, you just, you need a, another breaker for that, right? Or, or whatever the, you know, you might need a microgrid controller built into that switchboard. We can do that, right? The reason that matters is once you have that, you can do, you know, surge protection throughout that. You can do, you know, monitoring all the energy through any of the breakers. Well, you know, what's feeding the charger? Does that match what the charger is giving out, right? You can control that breaker from a distance and you, in some places, you can do a hard charger reset if you need to save a truck roll, right? And then probably more important and the biggest thing that, that people ask about when it comes to this topic is EV load management. And there's a couple of those around, right? A lot of, a lot of folks will have a very simple version of this where it's a feature here, a feature there, you know, what time of day kind of thing. Uh, but the real magic is when you can, when you can take your entire site, you know, like what's going on at the whole place, not just the chargers and put it all into, um, you know, a, a software controlled um, situation. And you can, you can 
load manage those chargers, still give everybody max power. You can understand charging curves. You can understand what else is going on at the site. You can tell when your battery's full, you can use the microgrid, you can know when the sun is shining. All of that comes into, into consideration on a full site, you know, EV load management or microgrid controller. We can put it all together. The end, the end result of all of that technical everything, right? The end result is that the end user has a smaller utility connection and they can do, you know, whatever application they need with their battery, right? They can do um, peak shaving or, you know, utility augmentation or, or even some power quality stuff with the battery, right? So there, there is a lot that can be done. It all comes back to, can you plug it directly in without having to purchase 600 new things, right? Like you just, one thing, right? This is why we've spent a long time thinking about this and, and pulling it together. In fact, um, we just, we just uh, worked with Greenlane to do one of their sites um, to, to add a microgrid controller to it. So it's pretty exciting, um, pretty exciting stuff when you see it out in the real world. Let, let's take a moment to kind of describe what the microgrid is for our viewers here. Um, you know, how is that unique or different? And just a brief description would be very helpful of, of the microgrid as we call it here. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have the official definition and Cliff, give yours after me, but I, I like to say that that a microgrid is is some, it, usually it's something on, on a particular site, a commercial site, an industrial site. You can even have a mini microgrid at a house, but like it's anything that's got a power source and a power storage uh, device of some type. So a lot of times you're going to see solar and battery, right? That's, that's a pretty typical microgrid um, connected to, you know, load. Uh, on the site. And so, um, you know, some microgrids are just going to be adaptive and they're going to be, um, aug you know, they're going to augment whatever the utility has. Some microgrids are going to have the ability to fully island and disconnect from the grid and just be self-powered or self-powered for a period of time, right? So more than a backup, it's usually got one of a dozen different applications it can do. But, um, you know, when you, when you think about what's possible with a microgrid, it's, really, really powerful for uh, connecting with EV charging. And I always like to say it's peanut butter and jelly for the future of fast charging. We're going to need more and more of the microgrid and the energy storage um, to, make the, to make the most efficient type of charging out there. I'm pretty sure also that um, like you can condition the, the power for a local area that comes from the grid by having local storage, um, pretty sure that applies to the microgrid as well. You are, you know, you have a nice energy storage solution there that should be able to allow you to get rid of some of the transients that are inherent to the, the, the applications, the loads, if you will. So um, is that a correct assumption? Any, anything that you could add to that? So, so there, there are different applications for it either. Uh, you might not have enough power from the grid or your service is not yet available because of utility approval times, uh, connection time, stuff like this. This is where microgrid really comes in uh, to help you to still provide the full power more or less uh, to the customer so that the customer doesn't have any implications and it's kind of shielding you a bit from the, from the grid side. Either grid is not there or you want to um, deal with renewables where you might not have all the renewables at a, at a certain time, but you still want to provide the same power to, to the vehicles, then a microgrid uh, is helping you. One of the other aspects is also cost. So therefore, if you have demand charges and all of that, a microgrid also helps you uh, to balance that out and use the cheapest uh, electricity available. Well, that's a good explanation. Um, with kind of some relation to that, um, same would apply with a number of vehicles that are fast charging simultaneously. Of course, you never want to have to limit their power if it isn't necessary, and hence one of the important reasons for the on-site battery storage, if you will. Um, but you know, when that happens, okay, we've exhausted all of our resources and even the grid can't supply enough. That's when you have to go into, okay, we're going to have to carefully pick which of the users gets less power than they want. Any thoughts on that? I mean, there's so many implications there, everything from 
you know, the physics of it to the ethics and, you know, somebody who might be in a hurry that would balance against someone who's not. So, um, yeah, I, I think what you see is uh, the difference between calculating a site on a piece of paper and actually what the customer sees. Because you in, in previous podcasts have discussed uh, charging curves and how vehicles are, are charging. Actually, the 400 kilowatt, which the DDA 400 can provide, 200 kilowatts on, on each port or 400 on one, barely any vehicle is doing that. And if you have two vehicles there, then one might already ramp down while the other still needs more, more energy. And with the power distribution you can do on the charger, you can overcome a lot of those uh, grid needs. And then if you have the microgrid solution, as, as we mentioned it, that's also going to help you. So just because you don't have enough energy on the grid or still in the microgrid, with balancing the charging aspect correctly, the customer might not even feel a significant difference. And if then just a slight difference instead of uh, a full grid integration. One thing, one thing I can add to that, Tom, is, you know, I, I think early days, people would put in fast chargers and there were a lot less of EVs on the road, right? Now, we have more EVs, we've got, we've got data on uptime, we've got, you know, basically people rating chargers and, you know, determining which ones are good and sharing their findings, right? Uh, there's a lot more understanding of making sure you can have enough power that you give the car what it can handle on its charge curve at that time or close to it, right? Because you don't want to have somebody pull up to a fast charger and see a two hour charge time available, right? So you have a lot more end users, sort of either fleet owners, they're, they're definitely figuring this out, but even CPOs now saying, let's make sure the power's there, right? How do you do that? Well, you know, there's utility, right? And then there is probably the better way, which is let's make sure we have load management and we have some sort of energy storage attached, right? Let's, let's get this so that the end user experience is good. So we're always thinking about the power quality. And the good news is our customers are finally you know, learning a lot um, in their own experience and bringing that to bear and being like, this is, this is how we need to think about this. This is the real demand of our site. Very good. So there's a sort of related subject to the grid, if you will. Um, there's a lot of variants of this V to X as it's often called, but V to G in this case, vehicle to grid. Um, does your system support that? I mean, can, um, an installation, take the battery vehicle, the vehicle's battery and use it to prop up the local area grid or maybe on a, on a different scale. It could be your, you know, on-site energy storage system propping up the local grid when there's nobody charging their vehicles. Some thoughts on that would be really helpful. Matt, Matt let, me, let me start on, on that one and then you take the rest because the vehicles are not ready. So right now, and there's a lot of discussion about uh, the standards, ISO 1511 8-20, uh, what are the capabilities of the vehicle, of the chargers. So you barely have any vehicles which can actually provide energy back to the grid via the charger. So therefore, on the vehicle side, we see much more uh, scheduled charging. But nevertheless, and this is why I wanted to have Matthew go, go next, the site with a battery can still provide a lot of those capabilities, even if the vehicles are not ready yet. Yeah, it's, you know, there, there, there is a term V to X and it, you know, of course encapsulates everything, but there's a big difference between V to G and V to H or V to home, right? Either way, you know, they're, they're, they're a little more tricky um, <laughs> than your normal setup. And as Cliff said, the cars aren't necessarily ready, right? And so you need four things for this to work. You need a car that can do reverse power uh, export. You need a charger that can do reverse power and be bi-directional. You need equipment at site and switches that can either island that building from the grid and just power the building and probably some software intelligence to go with that. Or you need equipment that can feed back to the grid and then that's the fourth thing you need is you need sort of approval 
uh, for that type of connection with the utility. And I, hmm, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'll add to that. But okay, I was just going to say there's not a lot of these around, right? Because there's there's a lot of there's pilots that are uh, that are that are moving. And so to answer your question, yes, uh, you know, equipment is needed in the middle of this, and you probably need a few more switches and some software layers. We can figure that out. But like ultimately, you need way more things to happen. Um, you know, and of course, everyone says school buses and they're right. You know, let's get school buses figured out to be like that sort of peak demand battery. Right. That'd be great. But right now, I mean, you can put a battery somewhere, never drive it. Right. Just put the battery in and you can have the same impact and not worry about connecting, unconnecting and have what, you know, like there's just a lot of there's a lot of advantages to doing it with a battery. And I was going to add, you know, maybe a fifth element needed there is um, an OEM who sells a vehicle who wants you to do that to their vehicle. Um, they have a warranty to preserve on that battery. And, you know, the more times you use it for purposes other than propelling the vehicle, the more they question whether or not they're getting a good deal on their federal mandated of. Uh, eight year, 100,000 mile warranty they have to provide on that thing. So I'm sure that's part of why they're not ready yet. Um, and, you know, certain OEMs are more ready than others. And as you said, when it's V to H, okay, they've got a way to do it. But yeah, you're buying the gear from them probably. And there's a whole lot of circumstances that are, you know, required for consideration. So and then adding on to that point, this is where the system thinking comes in, because the switchboards can be already bidirectional. So the switchboard can feed back. All the utility integration, uh, which Matthew's team has done, allow for feeding back. If you have a battery, not a vehicle battery, a battery, a storage battery on site, and you charge it during the day, you can also feed back at night or so to other times out of that, that battery. So you already have a grid support. In the future, when the vehicles are ready, then you can add also that movable battery, a vehicle to it, and not just the storage battery, but also the movable battery with the same part. So therefore, with the, 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 the ABB system and platform solution, you already bring this future proving in that you can add on when the vehicles are ready. Wow, fascinating stuff. So much more to talk about. Um, I understand you have a sort of simulation or probably a better description, a visualization tool about all these different systems and how they can interconnect. Um, you know, how does it work? Why'd you develop it? And yeah, you know, can we see it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll show it to you and everybody here if we get it, get all the uh, everything work out. But we built a simulator because um, <laughs> we saw we saw a really interesting problem. And that was, there was a lot of, you know, even, even though it uses very similar electrification materials, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding around how do you electrify a site to get it ready for chargers that can power vehicles, right? And so we were like thinking, all right, well, we can show everybody demos and we can show them, you know, examples of setups, but there's, there's thousands of possibilities for how you could electrify a site. So we wanted to educate all of our stakeholders, and, and again, this is not an iPhone, right? We're not buying an iPhone and a charger and just plugging it in, right? There's a whole industry that's required for installing and, and getting, you know, uh, electricity at your site. We wanted to make that faster. And the way that we can do that faster is to get people more familiar. And the way we do that is education. So we built this tool uh, and we, we showed it off at a few trade shows. Uh, pretty early on and asked for a lot of feedback. We, we still would love feedback. If anybody has any, we'd love to hear it. Um, it got real popular. And then we decided to put it online, make it free and just have anybody be able to get on there. And it's, it's, um, it's sort of like what to expect when expecting EV charging, right? Like it's a, it's, it's a way to visualize what's going to be going on at your location, depending on what kind of charger you choose. So um, if you want, um, I can do a quick, demo of it right now. Absolutely. So just let me know when it's coming through this, uh, the podcast recording here. It's in. Okay, great. So, so this is it. Very simple. We, we have a little bit of legal disclaimer at the beginning because this is not a design. It's not an engineered design. Everybody just, everybody be okay with it's a visualizer, a simulator, but you still need an engineer to properly, you know, design something for your site. 
um, you know, it, we start with what kind of chargers you have, right? And we can think about all of them or things for home or public, light duty fleets or even medium and heavy duty bus fleets. Um, basically, this is all about power level. So we show our chargers. It, it's, it's going to be kind of the same for anybody's, um, but it's all about power level. So the first thing I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to select this 180 kilowatt charger. Um, it's kind of what you might see at, a, say, a Nebi site right now. Um, and so I'm going to select 10 of these with this little slider. Um, I, I like to refer to this as sort of middle of the road these days. So there's, there's things that are slower, there's things that are faster. So we're, we're just going to go with the 180 for right now. Um, and here you go. Immediately you see what's a, going to be a very common setup in between the grid and the charger. Well, what you're looking at in the middle is a giant switchboard. <laughs> I say giant because it's, you can see the dimensions here. It's 96 inches tall, uh, 45 inches deep. And, you know, 85 inches wide. Um, it is, you know, it's something that you're going to have to have on your site. And a lot of people don't know this. So we like to show them how big these are. Right. Um, and in this case, there's a there's a cabinet, there's a utility cabinet. Depending on what part of the country you're in, you're going to have to have another cabinet on site. And that's in addition to your chargers, um, you know, sort of. And this will all this is all outdoor rated and everything else. Well, here's the fun part. You can take the slider and you can you can real time move your number of chargers up to, let's say, 30. And so now we know that that's going to be three switchboards and some probably some medium voltage cabinets, um, you know, out there. The real interesting thing here is besides the amazing products, uh, <laughs> the real interesting thing is over here on the left. And that's the utility service estimate. And so if you have 30, 180 chargers, let's say you're a, uh, I don't know, you're an aspiring Bucky's or you're a, a big truck stop off of a highway in the middle of the country or something. Um, or, 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 you know, big, big stopping area, right? You know, that's 5.7 megawatts at code level, right? So if, if, if everybody plugged in at a very low state of charge at the exact same time, code says you're going to need this much power coming through your system, 6,900 amp service, right? That's a lot. So um, basically what we all kind of know is the utility is going to look at this and say, we understand charging curves also, right? You're never going to need... 5.7 for 30 of those chargers. And they'd probably be right. You're probably never going to have 30 low, you know, <laughs> 30 cars come in with a 5% state of charge and plug in at the exact same time. So they will, they will do a, an adjusted utility service estimate. Like, and, you know, a lot of times let's, let, we, we just estimate about 75% that the utility might say they're going to give you. So we, we click that in here, right? So now we can see, all right, that's 4.3 megawatts. And when you choose that, there's actually a couple of things that change here in the middle. But the real magic is this, is this next option. It's EV load management solution. And we make one. A lot of people make them. We happen to think if you start with the, with the, with the breakers in the middle that you get a much better you know, future-proof design. Well, you can see immediately that that's a much lower number, you know, 2.9 versus 5.7. Here's the magic. You can call your utility today and say, what's the difference in timing and price between these two amounts? And you can make a financial business decision now. And I probably saved you a week in the calculation. And then I also showed you what, what to expect in your parking lot. And so it's, it's fascinating, you know, what, what you can, what you can do with this tool. And, and I'll show you one more thing that I just love, love to do. So I'm going to knock these down a few and I'm going to add a few of these sort of, uh, we'll call them commercial AC chargers. Let's just say you're a company that has a giant overnight fleet or sorry, not overnight giant fleet that charges overnight. Um, you know, you can, you can now see with 180 of these um, Terra AC, you know, or any, any sort of AC level two charger, you know, you're going to have a lot of these um, power panels out here and you can, you can just, you can still do it all in real time. You can figure out, you know, like, all right, if I call the utility and they say, you know, we can't give you that much power, you ask them how much power can you give me, and then, and then you roll it down and you can make a decision and say, all right, in our in our time frame as a business, we can we can execute on this number of chargers with the utility now, and so we we find this to be super valuable. Our customers tell us it's valuable. Um, it's 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 doing a lot of calculations. It's surprising how much math is involved, <laughs> how much. You know, like how many how many of our engineers have been involved with this? It's 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 really amazing. 
Um, but it helps people save time, gives them a sense of what's going on, shows them what's what they can expect and, and gives them a way to, to ask us questions. You know, they can they can immediately find us. Um, so anyway, so I'll just I'll leave it right here, Tom. And I don't know if there's anything you want to see on this before I stop sharing it with everyone. But you tell me. Well, the load management is of particular interest to me. I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of charging stations here at Monroe and Associates. And I do worry about the day where every employee shows up with their 5% state of charge. And yeah, then we have a big problem here. Um, so yeah, I'm curious how this load, load management scales. Um, will it work for an application as, as small as ours? And um, you know, what sort of advantage would I see from that if, if it did work? Yeah, I mean, it, it, and it all depends on what you put in. I mean, you, you can load manage a, a very complex system I and mean, you could have a ton of fast chargers. You could have a ton of the AC slow chargers. Like it's still the system that we've developed that starts in the, in the breakers. It, it, can, it can certainly scale up to whatever. And, and that's a really interesting point. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing here for a second. Um, get back to seeing you on camera. Um, it's a really interesting point because you're, you're a great example. When you install chargers, you have the first round, right? Your first decade of chargers is going to be this many chargers. And then in five years, you may add more or you may replace some, right? One of the things we found is this, this equipment that goes in the middle where some of these load management features exist and the building energy management features exist and the control exists and all this. Like that equipment's going to be in the ground for 30 years. And if anybody has paid attention to chargers, like, you know, you take care of them really well, which you should with the service level agreement, let's all be honest. If you take care of them for a, as well as you can, they're going to last you 10 years, maybe a little more. So ultimately you're going to have some change with your chargers. So you're either going to add exactly the same one again, which is probably not going to be the same in 10 years, right? You're going to add more, you're going to replace some and add more. You're going to have different brands. Who knows, right? So like ultimately what you want is an electrical system that doesn't care how many or which type you have. And that's the kind of stuff that we think about all the time is like, how do we make sure that that really is future proof uh, so we can really make the customers happy because nobody wants to pay for another switchboard in 10 years just because you added five chargers. All right. Some very good answers and a very impressive tool, the simulator, that is. Uh, great for visualizing all the complex scenarios and maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, experimentation uh, on the part of the customer where they can educate themselves about what they're about to get themselves into. Yeah, so, well, and we can share the link. I mean, if anybody cares, it's abbevg2c.com. So EV grid to charger, like abbevg2c.com. They can find it. You can find it on our website. We'll, I'm sure you can put it in show notes, but it's uh, it's free for anybody. All right. So, you know, there's a notorious problem in the infrastructure with people coming up to a charging station and finding out that it's out of order or, you know, they find out late that it's a really slow charge rate. Um, you know, there's it's perceived as a reliability problem. Um, you know, how does your technology um, differ or, you know, is it subject to the same sort of concerns? I mean, the, what are these concerns? This is everything from sabotage with people chopping the cords off all the way to, you know, maybe more sophisticated hacking down to, you know, just poor maintenance or bad design. So, you know, tell us some of the reasons why you're exempt or, or maybe still vulnerable and it's kind of a you know, a system wide thing that everybody deals with. I think the whole industry is still still dealing with it. And I think that goes also a little bit into what Matt told us with future proving. So the technology or the base uh, of the technology Matt described with the switchboards and all of this, this is around for for hundred years or so. Uh, it gets more uh, sophisticated with the addition of uh, computers and, and all of that. But the base technology, how you convert energy, is around for a long time. In the EV industry and in the charger industry, you see a lot of players uh, who are new to that, who 
come from a really easy perspective. I need a power module. I need something with a display. I need something which communicates to my vehicle and I put a housing and, and I'm, I'm done around it. And uh, I build a, a charger just for a specific application. So this is where ABB is really taking it to the next level with the, especially also with our new platform, the DDA 400, where we are building our own power modules. Uh, again, the electron uh, electronics in, in there are similar to what we are using for a hundred years in, in switchboards and power conversion to do that in-house so that we really can guarantee the 10 plus years reliability because you also have to design for 10 plus years if you want to have this. On the other side, it's diagnostics. So as I mentioned, we, we call it the, the cloud domain. Uh, Matt, uh, Matthew also mentioned that uh, you can read out all of the values of the switchboard of all of the components on site, bringing that together so that we actually see what, what's going on because the aspect of our asset management and how we manage the whole site and the system, we want to know about an issue before the customer knows about it. Exactly what you said. You don't want to have the customer going there and figuring out a power module is broken. I get only half of the power or a cable has an issue. I get just 90 kilowatts instead of 400 kilowatts. You want to know that um, ahead. And so that's where we are pulling all the data uh, into the cloud, analyzing it, and hopefully providing service to that side well before uh, the customer has the issue. This is where really ABB as a, as a company is providing the next step up to really provide the reliability and availability as asked by Navi and, and other um, incentives out there. We look at this as, you know, markets growing, right? And it's it's happening some people don't like it. Some people love it, you know, and, 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 and the, and the truth is like when people are ready to electrify, they'll electrify. And a lot of times it's a non-emotional financially driven decision. And so they can, you know, they can do that for their business. They can do it for their home budget. Like they can figure it out. And our job is just to be ready when they do want to electrify and to Cliff's point, you know, like you, you can't, this is not an arms race. It's not about installing chargers and turning away and never looking at them. You have to take care of them. They're, they're, they've got computers in them and you're leaving them outdoors, you know? So it really is like responsible charging means servicing these things and, and paying attention to them. We happen to make sensors and we happen to have a lot of cool things in the new platforms that help with that, right? So as we as we all travel this road together of electrification, I think you know the more innovation we can make, the better it will help customers and and homeowners and new EV drivers and everyone. And let, let me add, sorry one one more point to that is also that total cost of ownership aspect which we have uh, with what Ma Matthew showed with the with the simulator to really see how much uh, grid connection do I actually need. We have seen in the past that chargers were funded by programs or by uh, groups of uh, OEMs. And it was more getting chargers out there. Now we actually see a change in, in the industry where, where we have customers now looking for the total cost of ownership. What is the right charging pole? What is the right uh, grid constraints? How do I ensure availability? Because the charger which is down doesn't make money. So how do I go through that? So more from, as Matthew said, that arms race, getting more and more chargers out there. How do I make actually money off a charger to really have a, a profitable infrastructure out there? So, you know, that kind of leads me to my next topic here. Um, all these computers, surely there's a lot of data um, and a site owner might want to have a good look at that data and understand what their return on their investment is looking like. Um, what kind of data would we have? And I'll just kind of use a case study. Let's use this uh, hypothetical example of an installation here at Monroe and Associates. I would love to be able to log into that system and see how many of the chargers are running and you know what is the, the situation at hand. And you may have one car that's 
being charged um, unnecessarily and while somebody else is waiting in line. And it'd be wonderful to be able to come in there and just sort of change the priorities, um, you know, with maybe an administrator level um, input to that software. So what kind of data is there? What sort of software is there? You know, what kind of view does the, the owner have on, uh, you know, a complex installation? So this is where we as ABB Mobility really saying we are moving up the stack, uh, really on the software side, where at the beginning you only sold uh, chargers, more or less boxes, really moving up and providing that insight. We call it the asset management platform, which provides the customer those insights, which chargers are charging. If we have uh, ABB uh, switchboards, we can pull in that data as well. So you actually see also upstream, the so outside of the charger, um, all of the data. This is also where you can set your, your load management. If you have a uh, solar integration, you can see uh, those aspects as well. And if you have a priority set for this charger first and the other charger next, then you can also uh, change it there. Going then all the way, and this depends on the customer, if you are a small site, then you might want to set pricing for that. You can do that. If you are a large CPO and you have your own backend system and your own app and you set your own pricing there, then you can integrate there as well. So you keep your front end, but you use all the capabilities we can help to manage the, the infrastructure. We really want to, uh, provide the infrastructure operations. We run the infrastructure for you. You work with your customers, you work with your uh, end businesses and optimize that. I see. So what I'm envisioning there is like a um, an abstraction layer in your software that I would call an application programming interface where somebody who has, um, you know, the front end software, they just want to tie it to yours. Is that uh, a regular practice, uh, something that people could consider for integration? Yeah, this is our APIs, which we, which we have in place. And we see those APIs used on different aspects. One is if you have your own uh, ticket and, and case management. So if you're a large CPO, someone calls you and has an issue with the, with the charger, then you do that usually in your system. You call the API on our side, you send us down that case, we take care of the charger, through the API, we report back. On the other side is all dashboards and data because, uh, for example, we, I mentioned Navi before, if you want to do Navi, then you have certain uptime requirements. So you have to provide reports. Also for California utility programs, you have to provide them reports on session data in order to get your, your grant funding. All of that is either available via dashboards or via APIs where you can pull it into your own systems. So exactly as, as you described, those interfaces are available. And and Tom, from the from the from the breaker side, you know, we, we have built solutions that do both of those things. We'll either say we want to use an API to send the site management energy into a into a charger cloud somewhere or a back, you know, a charger backdrop, or we have customers that say, can you bring the charger information into ours, into the energy management? So it what it comes down to is do you have the ability to use open, you know, like to be open with a lot of other systems or are you totally closed off to the world with your own proprietary system? It's not a great idea now because you need to be able to connect to so many different things. Um, so, you know, be, being open to work with anybody, interoperability really matters um, for the future of charging. So with that, we've uh, pretty much consumed our, our hour here. Um, lots of good discussion. Um, you know, this partnership that you have with NASCAR, I will, you know, forever, um, you know, stand in awe about that. Such a daunting challenge um, and a really good start on that. I'll have to add with with the car and the talk about how you manage, you know, that type of a vehicle and that sort of a setting. Um, you know, I can't think of a better company for NASCAR to partner with for trying to solve that really unique problem. Thanks guys. And, uh, you know, good luck on your endeavor. And I'm sure we're going to be talking again.